Hey, let's get rolling early. We got 20 seconds on that song, but uh, I don't care. <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lafayette Community Church. I'm really excited that we get to be together here today and spend some time worshiping God, reconnecting with the most important thing in the world. And I want to let you know that if there's something on your heart, if there's a burden on your heart today, we are in a phase of our church called 21 Days of Prayer. And we especially have a prayer team available in the back corner. If there's something going on in your life, I invite you to just step on back there and ask them to pray with you and pray for you. There's nothing as encouraging in our lives as when one uh, Christian brother or sister prays for us and brings our needs before our Heavenly Father. It's just an encouraging thing. And so I want to encourage you to take advantage of that if you'd like. You also notice that we've got some post-it notes on the wall, and uh, we are praying for people in this context of our church. We are praying that God would be moving in people's hearts, but my heart today is that I want God to be moving in our hearts as we are together here in this place. And so we're going to be singing some songs, uh, we're going to be turning our attention towards God, but let's begin with an attitude of prayer by praying. Would you stand up with me and let's uh, seek Him. God in heaven, we recognize that you are the one above all other things. And so we bring ourselves to you and say, we want to know your love more deeply and more personally today. We understand and we believe the truth that you are God in heaven, that you love us. But Father, we pray that you would use the music and our time together in your presence here this morning to confirm this truth in our hearts, to make it real for us. We love you, we seek you, and we bring ourselves to you, asking for you to fill us with your spirit and your presence here in this place today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never 
You know what? The reason we're happy about that is that the thought of God, the unimaginable supreme being of the universe, being a God who doesn't fail us with his love is something that should just astonish us daily, astonish us all the time, that he is the one who loves us. You know, the scripture tells us that greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And yet, God loved us so much that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came to us. He chased us down just to show us he loves us. Unrelenting grace Never failing mercy found me in my shame and gave me life again. Father, you love me. I hear you singing. You are calling me home. You run towards me with love and
towards me with love and mercy though I'm unworthy you pursue me You know, sometimes it's hard for us to realize how much God loves us because we've seen those moments where we've faced hardship or pain or disappointment. And it's in those times that we kind of sometimes allow ourselves to doubt that God really loves us. We're going to sing a song that was written by a guy who had just lost a child. And he wrote this song out of a place of faith and out of a place of confidence that that even though he wasn't experiencing a miracle, he still worshiped a God of miracles. And so I'm not exactly sure what's going on in your heart or what's going on in your life these days or what kind of miracle you might be hungering for, but whether God actually does the miracle in us and with us and for us or not, he still remains the same. He is the one who makes the blind to see.
God, we come to you today and we reach out to you saying that we are people who believe this about you. We believe you have the strength. We believe you have the power. We believe that with a word from your mouth, all things were made and nothing exists except what you have made. You're the one who brings everything out of nothing and nothing stands in your way. We believe that you are the God of miracles. And so we seek you and we ask that you would renew them in our day and in our time. Lord, on these walls, we have names of people who are hungry for you. Names of people who don't even know they need you. But we call out to you for them. And we ask that you would move in their lives. We ask that you would transform hearts. We ask that you would reveal your love to them. We ask that you would move and let them know that you are real and that you care. Lord, we pray for the names who are on these walls who need a healing, need some type of touch from you. God, we reach out to you and say that you are the only one who can do what needs to be done in their lives. For some of them, it's a medical thing. For some of them, it's a heart thing. For some of them, it's a mind thing. But what really needs to be done is a soul thing. Lord, we call to you and ask that you would move in the lives of these people. Move in the lives of us who love them. And help us to be the strength that they need. Help us to be the perspective that they need. And help us to be the words that they need coming from you through us to them. Lord, we know that you can do miracles. And so we reach out to you and ask that you would move in our lives, reveal to us that you are at work. And God, we love you. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory. Thanks for moving in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Lafayette Community Church. My name is Bob. I've got a few announcements for you today. Uh, first of all, uh, Connect card. If you didn't get one walking in, uh, they're available in the back. Uh, we'd like you to fill it out, name, phone number, uh, email. It's a way for us to connect to you uh, and, and get to know you. Backside for prayer requests, uh, praise, re uh, uh, praise what's going well in your life. Uh, anything you want to share with us, uh, we'd appreciate it. Throw it in the basket on the way out, and there's an electronic form as well uh, that you can fill out, fill out this connect card. Uh, first, uh, first announcement, Discover LCC uh, today at 1210, right after service, the cafe behind uh, uh, our stage here. Uh, for the newer uh, people that want to get to know about our values, core values, get to know our leaders, ask some questions about who we are and what we're doing, it's right after church today, short little meeting. Uh, but hopefully we'll, you get all your answers there. Uh, Monday the 22nd, Ladies Fellowship Night. It's going to be a uh, refit with our own Tara Lebo. She, I don't know if she's here or not. Uh, she'll be leading it, and uh, they'll be also serving smoothies. Um, if you're not ready to dance yet or anything, um, I'm sure they, they'll, they'll like you to join them and, uh, and to share a smoothie with them as well. Then on the 27th at uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., they're doing CPR training here. Uh, we're doing it for our volunteers. It costs $20. There's going to be lunch included. Uh, but we, we want to open up to anybody that has, is going to volunteer in the future. Love to have that training for you here. And then the LCC Vision Dinner is also on the 27th from 6, or 6 to 8.30. Um, and uh, Jeff will talk more about that as, as he gets in uh, to his further announcements. Uh, he gave me a few minutes to add a couple of things. I've been to two mornings of the 21 days of prayer, and there's a lot of pain on these walls. And uh, I got a little bit of a story to tell you. Uh, my brother-in-law recently uh, has some health issues. He's a generally healthy guy. He's in his mid-60s. He doesn't like to go see the doctor. He hadn't been there in seven years. So he's leaving his church. They're having a blood drive. They say, hey, we want your blood. He's never given blood before. So they do that little iron test. Iron's really low. They tell him to go see a doctor. 
got some major problems. That little, that little test has, has found that he should be okay, but there's a lot of things for him to come up. But the doctor said, hey, if you would have came and s seen this once a year, we probably would have caught this a lot earlier, and the damage that's been done has probably would have been a lot less, and we could have fixed a lot of things. And I draw that to our doctor and spiritual and mind and, and, and our soul in Jesus Christ. And his medicine is the, is the, the Bible, the Word. And I find when I don't take my medicine every day that my spiritual pain starts to grow. And i got to get back to seeing my doctor, Jesus, every day and taking my medicine and reading that word. I just want to kind of share that story for you guys. See your medical doctor once a year. See your spiritual doctor every day. God is great. Thank you. He's, he's doing all right, doing all right. He's doing all right. Okay, so I'm really excited about today. Uh, Bob did refer to, uh, I've got a couple extra announcements that I want to draw your attention to. Of course, the first one is if you came in and you didn't get one of these note sheets, we do have them available in the back every week. Um, but if you didn't get one, you can grab it online right now. Uh, we have a special online electronic note sheet situation. We call it our live event notes. All you have to do is download our app on any one of the uh, internet devices that's out there, uh, Lafayette Community Church from any of the app stores, download it, and then in the menu off to the left-hand side, you'll see the link for our live event notes. If you click that, whatever shows up on the screen will be there on your device, and there's something in the live event notes this week at the very end of our time that I'm going to ask everybody to do. So if you have an internet-capable device, then go ahead and go there and make sure you're, you're on our live event as it's working. If you don't, then you can use the Connect card at the end of our time to fill out the question that I'm going to ask you, to answer the question that I'm going to ask you at the end of our time. So that's that. That's the first thing. I wanted to cover and just make sure that you've got a Bible in hand, whether it's your electronic Bible or a real paper Bible, it, it doesn't really matter. Just make sure it's one that you read. That's the most important kind of Bible that there is. Um, secondly, I want to draw your attention to the things on the walls. We are in a journey right now called the 21 Days of Prayer. And what that means is that we as a church are gathering together in prayer every single day for 21 consecutive days. Today is day number eight. And so we have gone through seven, and since we gather together every day for prayer, we had to figure out a time that worked well for most of us, and so for some reason, we decided to choose 6 a.m. during the week, and so from Monday to Friday, I was here at 5, I wanted to be here at 5.15, but I actually got here at 5.30, uh, every one of those days, and I tell you what, I'm really tired, okay? Um, but by the end of the week, I learned that if you just go to bed earlier, it makes it a whole lot it, it works a whole lot better. So, you, you know, once you get in the rhythm, it's okay. So anyway, uh, we met Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then on Saturday, we met here yesterday at, uh, from 9 to 10. And we've been having just a really good experience, time of prayer together. About 20 people have come each time. And that's been really encouraging to me, except, of course, for Friday morning when it was icy and slushy and we canceled and only one person showed up other than me, but I had left the door locked and so she left. And so, um, cause we, we canceled and we did it all by live stream. So if you're one of the lazy, excuse me, um, people who need to be for whatever reason at your house, uh, we do have a live stream that we turn on every morning at 6 AM that you can join us in with that. But the sound quality hasn't been all that great yet for that because, um, Chuck hasn't been able to come. And so he hasn't been able to, so yeah, anyway, so it's been all right. We've, we've been doing all right, but I want to draw your attention mostly to the prayer post-its on the wall. Because what's been going on is we've been praying over these requests for each one of, uh, during each one of these prayer gatherings. And you'll notice there are a couple different colors. First of all, there's the dark blue color, and we're using the dark blue color of post-its for anyone that we know who needs to know Jesus. 
We're just putting first names on those post-it notes. And uh, I tried to make it this last week, praying through all of that wall, uh, blue, dark blue post-it notes, slowly and prayerfully. Uh, all through this last week, I want to let you know that if you've got a name of someone over here on this wall, I myself really embraced that this last week. And I'm going to get to this wall this week, okay? So anyone over here? But um, So the dark blue notes are for that. The lighter blue notes are for anything else that you are praying for. Maybe it's someone in your life who needs a blessing. Maybe it's you who needs something. Maybe you're praying for something in the church. And so the lighter blue notes, post-it notes are all for that. But today we're adding a new color. We've got yellow. And uh, you'll see over here on each one of these stations, uh, tables, there's some yellow post-it notes. And on the yellow post-it notes, we want you to write answers and praises. And so we're adding that this week. And so you can see already some people have put some answers and praises over here. So if it's a brand new thing that's going on in your life that you just want to praise God for, write it down on a yellow post-it note and add it to our wall. But if there's something that you've been praying for that you previously put on a blue note and God is beginning to move in that area, make an update with a yellow note so that over this next week as people are praying through here, as we get more and more updates, we're going to put more and more yellow notes up on the wall. And next week I'll add another color, but we'll talk about that next week, okay? So we're augmenting that, and I'm just really excited about how, um, how people are coming out and how we are beginning to turn more towards God in prayer, and I think it's going to make a big difference for what's going on in our lives. The next thing and the last thing that I feel I need to share with you announcement-wise um, is that January is an interesting month for us. If this is your first January with our church fellowship, I want to explain to you that what we do every January is we spend the month talking about our core values as a church, it's sort of the basics of who we are, what we're all about, why we do what we do, stuff like that. And so that's why today we're having the Discover LCC thing right after this worship gathering in the cafe over here. I'm going to be there to answer questions. But at the end of the month, we're going to have our membership class. We call it LCC Basics, and we're going to have two different options for it. The dates are already on our church calendar. We'll be announcing them more specifically next week. But if you want to check out our church calendar, you can find the dates. You can reserve a time for yourself in your own calendar to be there. And we'll talk more about that next week. But if you're, if you're unfamiliar with who we are as a church, we want you to come to one of those classes. If you've already been to one of those classes, I want to remind you that we have our membership covenants available on the coffee bar. And I need to ask you to take a look at that and to read through that so that you can be prepared because at the end of January, we wipe out all of our membership. We clear all the rosters and we start fresh in February. The first Sunday in February, we call it our Commitment Sunday. And on that Sunday, we ask everybody to make a commitment to each other and to this church and to God uh, for this next year. And that's what our covenants are all about. So they're out there on the coffee bar. Grab one of those if you've never seen one and you need to double check or you need to double check, you know, if you're ready to make that commitment this year. So we're going to dig into God's word today and uh, let's pray and ask for God to move in our midst. Heavenly Father, we do seek you, and we recognize that we need you. Uh, you're amazing us with the truth that you love us, and so now we want to open our hearts up to you and let you speak to us. God, I pray that you would use the word that has been written, that you have already given, and you would bring it to a special kind of life in our lives today. We pray that by your spirit, you would illuminate it, empower it in us, and you would cause us to receive it as your words to us. Lord, I pray that you would guard the words that I speak and the thoughts in our hearts, and that you would shape what happens here in this place today to be according to your will, for your glory and for your good purpose in this world. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm really excited about this series. We're talking about vision. And I don't usually talk about vision. I don't usually use the word vision. In fact, the last couple of weeks, I've kind of told you why I tend to avoid the use of the word vision. Probably the biggest reason I tend to avoid the use of the word vision is that in the corporate world, vision has the connotation of some CEO or president, some leader, who says, I have a dream of a future thing. 
a future thing that we should all strive for. And then the leader sells the people on that future thing, the thing he's trying to get them to all go for. And then he's trying to get them to commit their resources, their time, their efforts to that future thing and to move towards that future thing. And in the CEO world, it sort of is like, this is the vision, this is the dream that the CEO is leading us all to. And you can either get on board or be fired. That's basically the way it works in the corporate world. Well, when it comes to churches, well, it basically works the same way. You know, the leader of the church says, this is the direction I think we should go. We all need to go in this direction and everybody needs to get on board and, and commit your time and commit your resources and commit your energy to making this thing happen. And we're all going to go forward to this vision together. And if you don't like it, well, there's another church right up the street. That's basically kind of the way it tends to work in churches as well. But we all know that the corporate model isn't good and isn't healthy for inside churches. We all know that churches should be better in some way. They should be spiritual. And so what we do is we spiritualize this process by simply injecting the words God told me into the whole thing. Because as long as the leader can say, God told me, or the leader can say, this is a vision from God, then all of a sudden everybody in the room has to accept what that guy says, or they're not with God. And that's, that's one of the problems that shows up in churches. And it's one of the reasons why I tend to avoid the use of the word vision, because I don't want to be that guy who's like, God told me this, and y'all got to get on board or ship out, or something along those lines. I don't, I don't generally like that. And so I tend to avoid the concept of vision or talking about it too much. I'm okay talking about mission because Jesus gave me a mission and that's really clear. But the idea of vision, sometimes I just don't want to talk about too much. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that sometimes God speaks to people in really obvious, tangible ways. I believe that sometimes God will say to a person, I need you to go in this direction and you need to bring as many people along with you as you can. I believe God does that. He sometimes actually does that. But... I also have to admit that I'm a cynic about how often it's authentic. And so I don't want to come across as the inauthentic, and so I debate and I worry and I stress about this whole vision thing. But I think God has been leading me. God has been teaching me something that I'm beginning to get the sense of. And so in this journey, I'm trying to help you see a little bit of what I'm beginning to see, and maybe as we go through this journey together, God will give us greater vision. Because I believe God wants us to be people of vision. He wants us to be people who can imagine something greater than we currently see with him and move towards it. And so three things are our recipe for vision. We're doing three things to try to develop a, a greater vision in and among ourselves. And the first one is this. We are strengthening our faith in God's will. Strengthening our faith in what God is really up to. Number two, we are praying for God to open our eyes of hope towards this world. See, we want to be founded on something strong, God's will in this world, faith. And then we want our eyes to be open to something that could happen in our world, something that is a good thing that we would like to see happen, but it's not real yet. And so we're asking for God to open up our eyes to that good thing. And then finally, we are praying for vision for us to play our part. We need a specific strategy, a specific vision, a specific idea of what our individual part is to play. And this, you should know, is not just me standing up in front of the congregation saying, okay, so I'm the pastor, I come up with a vision, and we all got to move into it to get, you all have to move into my vision together. I am actually asking for God to turn you into a person of vision. Not that you would necessarily be, be locked into my vision, but that we collectively would be people of vision. And that we would see the good thing that God is leading us into and we would step into it with the faith in what God is up to in this world. I want us to all be there. Because see, here's the truth. Vision is sometimes snake oil. Where someone will say, this is where we're going to go and everybody give your money to me and everybody give your time to me and give your effort to me and this is where we're going to go but they never actually get there. You just use the vision thing to convince people to go along with you. But at the same time, vision is what changes the world. It's the crazy people who think that something can change 
who actually change things. And so that's where we need to figure out where we need to stand. And so we will build a foundation on faith in what God is really up to. We will ask God to give us hope for something that could be done in this world. And we will ask God to give us individually and collectively vision for what our part should be. The problem is there are some roadblocks. Uh, in my life, I have two major vision roadblocks. Uh, you, maybe you share these roadblocks with me. Maybe you have different roadblocks. But I'm going to at least share with you mine. Uh, these are the things, and I'm going to phrase them as a we because I kind of hope that they uh, touch more people's lives than just my own. But these are my own vision roadblocks, and I think they're more universal than just me. Number one, we don't think we have the right vision. We don't think we have the right vision. And number two, we don't think we're the right people. We don't think we're the right vision, we have the right vision, and we don't think we're the right people. You see, I might get an idea, and this idea, I think, well, that could really do something good in this world, and that idea could really honor God in this world, but maybe it's not from God. Maybe it's not really God's wish for me. Maybe it's not really God's will for me, and so because I don't really know it's the right vision, I just kind of step back and don't do anything. And I just let that thing sit out there until my procrastination kills it. And then I wait around for God to reveal something else to me that maybe I won't do. And because I'm not convinced that that thing is really the right vision. And I don't want to make a mistake. Or, or I also worry about not being the right person. That maybe that vision is still a good vision, but I'm not the right person to step into it. I don't have the skills or the resources or the ability or the time or commitment level or stick to or persistence to actually get it done. And I worry, am I the right person for this particular mission, for this particular vision? And so these are my roadblocks. These are the things that stop me, and I think they probably stop you too, because we have all seen vision fail. We've actually also seen vision succeed. I know you've seen people in your life who have succeeded with a vision. They said, this is the thing I'm going to do, and they pursued it, and they got it, they won it, the vision happened, it came to fruition, and you watch those people, you look at those people, you see their success, and you say, well, I'm not like them. I'm different from them in all these different respects. And because you have seen success, you know what successful people look like, successful people of vision, you know what they look like, and you're different from them, and you compare the worst parts of you to the best parts of them and say, maybe I'm not the right person. Or you've seen failure. You've seen failure in that other person. They thought they had the right vision. They thought they were the right person, but they weren't, and it failed, and you don't want to be there, and you avoid it. And you've also been there, where you thought you had the right vision, and you thought you were the right person, and it didn't go the way you wanted it to go, and you just, you just don't want to be burned again. So we have these worries, we have these concerns, am I the right person, is this the right vision? And because I can't say absolutely, certainly yes to both of these things, we just don't move at all. They're the roadblocks to vision. In order to deal with these, what I want to do is I want to share with you a, a story of a man from the Bible who we would all consider to be probably the man of greatest vision in the Bible. Of course, except for Jesus, but Jesus knew the end. You know, he knew uh, things that we don't know. And so this is the guy who is probably the guy of greatest vision in the New Testament other than Jesus. And you might already know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about a guy that we all generally call Paul. But we're going to look back at his story before he was called Paul. We're going to look at his story back when he was called Saul. And I want to share with you something about his vision that I think will help us with our vision as well. It's in Acts chapter 9. Turn your Bibles there, and we're going to look at this story. Uh, as you're flipping your Bibles or scrolling up or whatever it is you're doing, I'm going to give you just a little bit of narrative of what's happened so far. So what happened is Jesus was crucified, and then he rose from the dead on the third day. He appeared to all of his disciples, and they're like, wait a minute, you're not still dead? And Jesus is like, no, I'm alive. And all of his disciples are like, wait a minute, so that means when you said you were God, you were telling the truth? 
And Jesus is like, "Uh uh-huh. And so all these people are like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Jesus stays with them for a little bit of time. Then he goes back up into heaven and they wait around praying until the Spirit of God comes, transforms their lives, gives them boldness and insight. They begin to share about Jesus. More and more people come to follow Jesus. And eventually there's about 5,000, maybe even 10,000 people who are part of this movement called The Way. Because Jesus referred to himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And so they refer to their movement of Jesus' followers as people of the way. So now we've got maybe 10,000 people living in Jerusalem who are followers of the way. And the old guard, the Jewish people, particularly the Pharisees, are upset. Because, see, this is a problem. That Jesus fellow, we killed him. And he needs to stay dead. That was the idea, you know? We killed him. He needs to stay dead. There's this rumor that he came back, but we didn't see him. And so as a result, we need to also kill this other thing. And that's where we come face to face with a man named Saul. Saul was a Pharisee. Verse 1, chapter 9. Meanwhile, while all this good stuff was happening with the church, there was also stuff going on behind the scenes. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's people. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. This is Saul. This is who we have. This is a guy of vision. A guy with a passion, a guy with an idea, a guy with an idea of something good that should be done, and he's willing to step in to do it. His vision comes down to two basic points. Number one, he was committed to speak against Jesus and his followers. He was committed to speak against Jesus and his followers. He's speaking out murderous threats, it says. So he is try- he's bold, he's aggressive, and he is just speaking against Jesus wherever he can. Number two, he is trying to go wherever he can to destroy the church. This is Paul. He's a, Saul, he's a man of vision, he's got this idea, and he says, I am coming up with this idea, I am going to speak out against Jesus, I'm going to be bold, I'm going to be aggressive, and I'm going to be strategic in the way I talk about it, I'm going to speak against Jesus, and I'm going to be bold, and I'm going to be aggressive, and I'm going to go wherever it takes me, wherever I have to go, to destroy this movement, this church thing. Now, you've got to know something about Paul. He wasn't dealing with these roadblocks. Paul was convinced that his vision was right. And Paul was convinced that he was the right man for the job. And you know what? He was right. Paul's vision, Saul's vision was right. I mean, think about this. Jesus had claimed to be God. Do you know what that is? That's called blasphemy. And so Jesus claimed to be God, and the Jewish people were like, no, that's blasphemy. You should die. And so they killed him. So they put him on trial. They convicted him. And he then was killed. The Messiah shouldn't be killed. The Messiah was supposed to reign as king forever. And so if Jesus really was the Messiah, then he was just killed. And as a result, he couldn't have been who he claimed to be because he claimed to be God. And God couldn't die either. So here's this guy. He blasphemed. He lied. He led a whole bunch of people astray. And now he's dead. At least Saul thinks so. And he's dead. And so as a result, Saul's strategy, his vision, is entirely right. He should be speaking out against this fraud. All of the Pharisees, all of the religious people, all the Jewish people, they knew Jesus was a fraud. Because God couldn't die on a cross. The Messiah couldn't die on a cross. So clearly he was just faking it. Saul was right. He also thought he was the right man for the job. And guess what? He was right. Because Saul was a Pharisee among Pharisees. And it was the Pharisees who were all over God's law. 
They knew what it was. They knew what they needed to do. They knew, they knew uh, who Moses was and what he meant when he said what he said. And the other things that Moses didn't say, but he probably did mean, the Pharisees knew all that stuff. And Saul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was trained by the number one Pharisee, Gamaliel. And then Paul or Saul actually was a guy, he tells us later, that as far as all the Pharisees' rules, he was faultless. Now, listen, I'm not faultless at basketball let alone all the religious rules that he must have had to deal with. So I have no idea what kind of disciplinarian or disciplined guy this Saul was, but he says that he never missed a Pharisee law. He was faultless. He was the perfect guy for this job. And he was willing to go wherever it took, and he was bold, and he was aggressive, and he was going to take care of these things. Saul was the right guy with the right vision, except for one problem. He wasn't, and it wasn't. Because, see, there's one little problem with Saul's stuff, and it's that Jesus said things that were exactly opposite. In fact, let me share with you something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16. Look in Matthew chapter 16 with me. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus, in that passage, what he's saying is I'm going to build something. We're going to call it the church. And guess what? Nothing in all of the universe will be able to oppose it. Not even hell itself, not even the power of hell itself will be able to stand against my church. Saul was trying to destroy the church, but Jesus had already said, nothing in the universe can stop this thing. What about this? Jesus also said in Matthew 5 something else. He says these words. Take a look at this. Jesus says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Who are the blessed people? The blessed people in this passage, according to Jesus, are the ones who receive the persecution, not the ones who give the persecution. Saul thought he had the right vision, but Jesus had already said, listen, you're trying to destroy something that can't be destroyed. Saul thought he was the right man for the job, but Jesus says, listen, it's the people you're persecuting that I'm going to bless. It's not the people who are doing the persecuting that I'm going to bless. It's the people who are being persecuted that I'm going to bless. So Saul, guess what? You're the wrong guy with the wrong vision. Now, Saul wasn't paying attention to any of that. And in fact, we've only covered two verses, so we should probably keep reading to see what happens next. Because what happens next is when Saul comes face to face with his vision in a way that changes things. Take a look with me at this. Chapter 9, we're still there. Verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And the the irony of this passage I find almost comical. I, I find it almost funny. Here's Saul, this man of incredible vision. And he's going to Damascus to do this mission. He's on his way to Damascus with this vision of destroying the church. He's on his way to Damascus with this vision and he gets a vision. He gets a literal vision where God shines this heavenly light all around him, and that's the last thing it says about seeing. From that point on, everything is hearing. Even the guys near Saul, they hear something, but they don't see anything. And then at the end of this story, Saul gets up off the ground, and he can't see anything. What you got here is you've got a man of vision who had a vision that removed his vision, I just find that funny. Here's Saul. He's a man of incredible vision, and then all of a sudden, he sees this incredible bright light, and that's the last vision he has. He doesn't see Jesus. He hears Jesus. He doesn't see a vision. He hears this vision. 
And it comes to him and it takes away his vision. Completely makes him blind. And this whole encounter here, just something about that makes me think that God is like being intentionally metaphorical and funny and ironic and it's perfect. Let's keep reading. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So Saul actually has a second vision. Now, we don't hear Saul talk about his vision. Instead, we see, uh, we, we read about Ananias getting a vision from God where God tells Ananias that Saul had a different vision. So Saul has had two visions, one on the road to Damascus, the one that knocks him down, and then he had a second vision, and in the second one, he sees a man named Ananias who comes to restore his sight. And then Ananias replies, Lord I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Here's the thing. Saul has this encounter on the road of Damascus that basically gives him no information. In fact, it puts a halt to his vision. And then Saul is praying and fasting for three days. Now listen, there's all sorts of speculation that Christians have had throughout the centuries about what Paul was doing during those three days. Oh, maybe during those three days, Paul was just having this amazing communion with God because he couldn't see. And so it was all just spiritual vision after spiritual vision and he was just having this amazing moment with God. Well, guess what? That's not written in the text. In fact, all we know is that Saul had one vision and that vision was simply about a dude named Ananias who was gonna heal him. And guess what? Saul actually tells this story three times. Uh, We hear this story two other times in the book of Acts. And I'm going to take you to the last one where Saul himself shares his own story about the vision he received from God. And that shows up at the very end of the gospel of Acts because by the time we roll around to the end of the book of Acts, uh, Saul is telling more details to his story. And so we get the most detailed picture of Saul's vision on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 26. Take a look at this. Saul is saying his story. He says, then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. Keep going. He says, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I want you to take a look at this. And this is the most detailed depiction of Saul's vision that we get. This is Saul's own words after he's called Paul. It's his own words of what that moment was like. He never tells us about the three days between losing his sight and getting his sight back. He never tells us about a bunch of visions or insight. He never tells us about Ananias' message to Paul. In fact, this seems as if it's a combination of what he heard on the road and what Ananias shared with him. So it seems as if this description here is that entire three days summarized. So I want you to take a look at it and notice one simple fact. Saul's visions 
did not contain a road map. See, I want to be a person who receives a vision from God. I think that would be awesome. Terrifying, but awesome. And there's a part of me that wants to have that moment where uh, the, the bright light shows up. And I get some sort of vision, whether it's like Paul or Ananias or one of the other biblical characters. There's a part of me that wants this vision. But guess what? When I want that vision, you know what I really want? I want a road map. The thing I think would make the vision so great is that I could stand there and I could look at God and I could say, God, what am I actually supposed to do next? And God, am I actually the right person for this job? That's what I want to know. I want to know where to go and am I good enough? Those are my questions. And the reason I want a a vision to come into my life is so that those questions can be answered. Where God would say, here's your roadmap. It's designed for you. You're good enough for it. Saul doesn't get one. I mean, he literally had multiple visions, and he doesn't get a road map. But see what he does next. Without a road map of what to do next, what does Saul do? Acts chapter 9, we're still there. Now we're going to look at verse 19. After taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Wow, what a difference. He has this vision on the road to Damascus. He loses his eyesight. Three days later, he gets his eyesight back, and immediately he's out there preaching about Jesus. What a change. I mean, just think of the contrast between the guy that Saul was and the guy that he now is. He used to be a guy who would aggressively and boldly speak out against Jesus. And now he's a guy who is aggressively and boldly speaking out for Jesus. He used to be a guy who would go wherever it would take to go through the entire city of Damascus to help destroy all of the followers of Jesus, destroy the church. And now he's a guy who's going all throughout Damascus to help build the followers of Jesus, to help build the church. That doesn't sound that different, does it? I mean, it, also, it almost sounds like Saul is actually the same person afterwards as he was before. He was bold and aggressive and strategic before, and he's bold and aggressive and strategic now. Beforehand, he was willing to travel wherever it would take and do whatever it would take to try to destroy the thing that was wrong, and now he's willing to go wherever it would take to try to build the thing he thinks is right. It's almost as if Saul is the same person before and after this experience. He hasn't changed, but something has changed. And do you know what the difference is? Jesus. That's the difference. The difference is that Saul met Jesus. Before Saul met Jesus, he's bold and aggressive against Jesus. He meets Jesus, and now he's bold and aggressive for Jesus. Saul was bold and aggressive and strategic and willing to travel wherever it would take to destroy the church of Jesus, and then he meets Jesus, and now he's bold and aggressive and strategic and willing to go wherever it takes to build the church of Jesus. The only thing that has changed for Paul is meeting Jesus. He met Jesus He fell in love with Jesus. He decided Jesus was worth something, and he continued to be the same person. See, here's the amazing thing about Saul's journey. Quite frequently, we look at a guy like Saul, and if you know the story of Saul, you know that it's usually told as if here's this guy who hated Christians, and now he loves Christians, and it's this big transformation story, but I want to focus in on this other thing. The guy he was is the guy he is. It's the guy he was supposed to be. Because this guy, 
based on his boldness and his strategic uh, ability to think through things, based on all of what he actually is, he ends up writing nearly half of the New Testament. He ends up starting most of the churches that start in the New Testament. He ends up taking the message of Jesus all the way to Caesar himself. Even though Caesar was killing Christians, Paul, Saul, is the guy who takes the message of Jesus to Caesar's own household. This is a man of vision, and guess what? He is the same man before and after, and the only difference is Jesus. Jesus is with him. See, this is the truth that I want to help you understand, and and me too, is that our dilemma, our roadblocks, that we don't have the right vision, that we aren't the right person. I want to speak two bits of truth into your life. I'm calling it vision truth number two, but uh, there's really two parts to it. There's an A and a B, and part A goes like this. The person I am is the raw material for the person I am to become. The person I am is the raw material for the person I am to become. We spend a lot of times worrying about not being good enough, not being strong enough, not being brave enough, not being bold enough, or whatever it is in your life that you think is valuable. And you compare yourself to the other people that are out there, and you find your weaknesses, and you compare them to their strengths, and you say, I don't measure up to that, and so therefore, I'm not the right person for this thing. Someone else should do it. Someone else is smarter. Someone else is better. Someone else has more money. Someone else has more resources. Someone else has more time. And so because I'm so limited, I can't get into it. But guess what? Who you are right now is exactly the person God needs. Who you are right now is exactly the person God wants you to be. You're not hearing a lot of pastors in a lot of churches tell you to stay exactly the same. And I'm telling you to stay mostly the same. Because who you are is the raw material for who God wants you to be. The only difference between who you are and who you are to be is how you respond to Jesus. How I respond to Jesus is what makes all the difference. I want to share with you this passage from Jesus' own mouth from John chapter 15. We looked at one of the verses from this passage last week, but I want to share with you uh, the verse in a larger context. Jesus says, I am the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. And he continues, he says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Nowhere in this passage does Jesus say, you got to be different. You got to be better. You got to be stronger. You got to get your act together. You got to figure out what's in and what's out and you got to cut out the stuff that's wrong and you got to get the stuff that's good into you. He doesn't say you need to get some more nourishment. He doesn't need to say you need to spend more time in your Bible. He doesn't say you need to spend more time in prayer. What he says is you need to spend more time with me. See, reading your Bible is just a thing to do unless you're spending time with Jesus. Praying is just a thing to do unless you're spending time with Jesus. Going to church is just a thing to do unless you're spending time with Jesus. Walking from here to anywhere else is just a thing to do unless you're spending time with Jesus. Talking on the phone is just a thing to do unless you're spending time with Jesus. Having a conversation with someone else in this church or outside this church, your neighbor mowing your lawn, anything it is that you do is just a thing to do unless... You're spending time with Jesus. He says, abide with me and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, nothing. Here's the thing. I just want to encourage you to be people of vision by saying what I am and who I am is what God wants. I just need to let Jesus get more into me because me without Jesus is wrong, but me with Jesus is right. 
here in our church, we try to help people get connected to Jesus in a deeply personal way. It's our mission statement. We say we exist to help people discover life in Christ, life with Jesus. And the way we do that around here is by emphasizing this particular metaphor that I really love, that is that I am dirt. And it's okay to be dirt because God never intended for me to stay dirt. He wants to get his hands on me and his breath in me and then I become a miracle. Because just like a potter will turn clay on a wheel, God can start with something that to the outside world looks absolutely worthless and bring it into something beautiful and useful. And see, that's, that's what God would do with you and with me. He's going to take the raw material of our lives and he's going to add Jesus and something great happens. And so I want to encourage you to be a person who's willing to add some Jesus to your life. Today, maybe for you, it's making the first decision to say, Jesus, you can have me. I give you me. We're going to sing a song right here at the end of our, our time together. It's called, Oh, Come to the Altar. And it just, says, it just says, you need to come to Jesus. You need to come to this altar, this place where you can meet with Jesus. And, and let him transform you. But more than that, I know you need to just make a decision in your heart to give your life to Jesus today. But next steps are important too. And so in your live event, there's a question right at the very bottom, a little poll, a, a survey kind of thing. And I want you to mark something down, fill out your email address or cell phone or both and hit the send button so it goes to me. But here's the simple question. One, you can say, I am ready to have a coach, which means I'm ready to have someone else enter into my life to help me identify what my next step is with Jesus. Number two, you might say, I am ready to be a coach. I'm ready to take my next step to help someone else take their next step. Or you might say, I'm not ready yet because, and if you do that, you have to send me an email to tell me why. You have to send me an email or text message or something to tell me why you chose that one. What is your because? It's okay if you have a because. I just want to know so I can pray for you better. But perhaps today is your day to mark one of those other two. I'm going to give you some time now. We're going to spend just a few moments in reflection before we sing our final song, and I want to invite you to answer that question. Maybe you're going to write it down on a Connect card, or maybe you'll just use the app. I also want to invite you, if during our final song you have a burden on your heart, something you want prayer for, or a praise, come forward and add more to our prayer walls so that this week we can be praying for you. But let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, we reach out to you and say that we need you. We need Jesus. Lord, so much of our lives we spend kind of beating ourselves up and saying that we're not good enough. And we know that you don't want to leave us where we were or where we even are. You want to take us to what you've made us to be. But the journey from here to there is Jesus. He's the way. So Lord, would you cause us all in this room today to give our hearts more fully over to you, to give our lives more fully over to Jesus, to receive him more fully into us, to spend daily more time abiding with him. And Father, would you use that in our lives to give us the right vision and make us the right people because we're with your son. Be with us even right now as we spend these moments before you.
go from this place today, let me encourage you to realize that you have found a treasure. You have found a great treasure in Jesus, and He is the one who makes all the difference. He's the one who can make our wrongs become right. 
Not that the bad thing all of a sudden is now okay, but that we lose all desire for the things that draw us away from God. We lose all passion for those things because our desire is too much for Him, too much for our Savior. So as you go from this place today, let me encourage you to receive that treasure daily, to receive that opportunity daily to be with Jesus, and then to share that with someone else. Tell the world of this treasure that you found. A great time to do that would be this afternoon. There's a Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration, worship gathering downtown at the Long Center that uh, our church and a whole bunch of other churches are sort of collaborating on. So that's at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Another great time would be tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. right here. I'll be here, will you? God bless you as you go in his name. We'll see you soon. Bye.